Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on cyber breaches and what's the worst that can happen. My name is Emma Green, and this is John Green. So I'm Emma Green from Green CDL. We provide cyber data protection and legal services. Uh, I have 20 plus years uh, experience in training and uh, consultancy, and I've got a, a postgraduate certificate in data protection law and information governance. So, John. Yes, good morning, everybody. As, as Emma said, my, my name is John Green. Um, I'm a senior lawyer who specializes in data protection, cyber security. I've been qualified now for uh, 15 years. Uh, currently studying for, for Masters in Cyber Security at the Defence Academy in the United Kingdom. Can, can I just say, although myself and Emma have the same surname, we're, we're not actually married, although we are partners in both life and business. It's just, just if Emma, Emma says, darling, in this webinar, she's in my queue to, to, to shut up. Thank you, darling. Anyway, <laughs> general housekeeping, some housekeeping. Um, just a few points. Uh, everybody's on mute at the moment, uh, but if during the webinar you have any questions, uh, if you can place them in the chat window, you can raise your hand and at the end of the session we'll be having a Q&A. So I'm just going to uh, share some slides that I'm going to be running through. So just a bit about Green CDL. Uh, the CDL in Green CDL stands for Cyber Data Protection and Legal. Uh, and this is broken down into three areas. Training, we provide face-to-face -face training, and at the moment it's all gone virtual. And we've also got award-winning, cost-effective e-learning. We provide consultancy for businesses. Um, we help them to understand and mitigate their risks of cybersecurity attacks and data protection breaches. Uh, thanks to John, we can provide legal services, so we can provide confidential advice and support on compliance and when things go wrong and we are a certifying body for Cyber Essentials. So let's have a look at some of the COVID-19 related cyber crimes that have been happening recently. Um, since the start of this pandemic, cyber crime has um, increased exponentially. The figures that the police have been quoting to us are in the region of 400%. Um, phishing is Primarily, the uh, attack cybercrime that's happening at the moment. So, lots of companies have got you know the magic tech to help try and capture these phishing emails. For example, before they get through to the company, but phishing can be in the form of an email. It can be voice. It can be a text. And fun fundamentally, the criminals want one of three things. They want to take you to a fake website to try and get you to log in. Uh, an example last week was an employee from an accountancy firm uh, who clicked on a link, was taken to a fake website. He logged in with his uh, company credentials. Then 5,000 emails were sent out to clients and they were ringing the business wondering what was, uh, what was going on. They may want you to download a file with some malware in or obtain personal details such as username and password. This is common for things like banking crimes. One of the big business cyber crimes at the moment is email compromise. Um, this is where somebody's got, got into your, uh, your emails, they doctor invoices and then send those invoices out to your suppliers or to your clients. And then obviously, potentially those clients can pay that invoice and then uh, to, the, uh, to the criminals. So we have many clients who've sadly been victim to, uh, to such a crime. For example, one of our clients was um, an invoice got sent out to a, a, a supplier. The supplier paid it. It was for $360,000 and they've since, it's since bankrupt, uh, bankrupted them. So John, in cases where an invoice has been hijacked and the money has been transferred, who's liable in those instances? Well, that, that's that's a really interesting question, actually, because there, there's an ongoing case in the UK at the moment where um, a London art dealer loaned a constable painting to a museum in the Netherlands, and they later agreed to purchase the painting for, for £2.4 million, pounds, a, a lot of money. Unfortunately, the emails have been intercepted by hackers who had substituted the art dealer's bank details with that of a fraudulent account in Hong Kong. 
And the museum paid the money without question, which then disappeared to other accounts all around the world. It was gone. Um, so what's happening is, is the, the museum is actually suing the art dealer for a determination that they, they now actually own that painting. Um, their argument is that the art dealer was negligent in that they owed a duty of care to maintain reasonable email cybersecurity. And actually the court dismissed that argument and said there is no such duty of care. But since then, the, the museum's actually made an application to amend the claim against the art dealer, and we wait to see what those, those amendments are. So I'm afraid from the civil court's perspective, they offer you little in the way of protection. If you pay out to a fraudulent account, then um, I'm afraid it's, it, it's your problem. Uh, I mean, this type of case would have been easy and simple to prevent with some, some kind of two-factor authentication to, to double-check correct bank details before making any payment, whether it's to an existing customer, a supplier who's changing the bank details, or to any new supplier or, or new customer you've not paid before, ring them up, not with any number on, on the invoice or an email, but on a number you know them by, and just double check you've got the correct bank details because prevention is better than cure, as unfortunately, there is no cure. When the money is gone, it's gone. Thanks, John. Another real top tip is if you are setting up new bank details for a, a client, a customer, or, or even just for you know, your local builder, what our advice is to uh, transfer one pound uh, to start with to ensure that uh, it has been sent to the correct uh, bank account and then you're, you're, you're confident that it's gone to the right place. Um, finally, this, uh, on the slide, it talks about an HMR, uh, HMRC smishing and bishing scam. This is really sad. Um, the victim was uh, received a, an HMRC uh, text message. They clicked on the link, and then what happened was um, the bank rang up and a fake bank rang up and said there was a fraudulent transaction on your account. Uh, the victim then revealed certain bank details, and the victim sadly lost thirty thousand pounds. So in terms of other trends, let's have a look at some real examples. Now, these examples have been taken from uh, the Northwest Regional Organised Crime Unit and the Manchester Police and Action Fraud. Um, according to them, the trends that we are seeing at the moment are social media accounts being hacked for the purpose of fraud. What's happening is once those accounts are being accessed, the criminals are contacting victims, friends and family, asking for money to help either with a financial situation or some sort of emergency. Ransomware for businesses has really increased. Uh, this is because everybody, well, the majority of people who have been suddenly, due to COVID, been working from home remotely, and those cyber criminals know how reliant businesses are on their IT, so they're finding weaknesses and then um, uh, injecting you know, some nasty uh, ransomware. And sim swapping, there's been an upsurge in sim swapping, um, mainly for, again, the criminals are trying to bypass uh, two-factor authentication uh, with the aim of getting access to people's bank details. Other frauds that we've seen are fake DVLA websites charging £40 to sawn your car when it's free. Uh, numerous uh, fake websites offering face masks, hand gel and PPE that never arrive. An example is in the North East, somebody lost 72,000 um, pounds. Collecting money for the development of vaccines. Websites posing as charities, inviting donation for victims and the NHS and key workers. Fraudsters claiming to be from the World Health Organization. Lots of HMRC, uh, tax refund, goodwill payment, furlough type payment, uh, text messages and emails. So, John, this is a picture you took. Would you like to yes. explain what it is? Well, um, I'm actually interested in astrophysics, uh, and not so long ago, a team of scientists from all over the world actually managed to photograph a, a black hole for the first time. It, it, took, it actually took them 10 years to collect the data needed. And there was a program all about it on the BBC that, that I was watch, watching. And as I was watching it, I was quite astonished as one of the team was explaining how much data they'd actually collected over the 10 year period. Um, but they were a bit worried as they do not have any backups. They actually admitted that on the, on the program. And I thought to myself, okay, you, you're pretty much leaving yourself wide open here to, to a ransomware attack. 
and you'd probably pay it to, to retrieve your data because you've no backups. This then came up as somebody writing on a whiteboard. I actually had to rewind it as I could not believe what I was seeing. There at the top, admin password, and not a very secure one at that as it's the, the actual name of the project, Event Horizon. I could have been into their systems, installed ransomware, demanding Bitcoin before this program had even finished on the television. Uh, the team was actually led by a professor at Harvard, and at the time I, I was actually studying cybersecurity at Harvard University, so I was able to private message him with what I saw and, and sent him this picture. And I can assure you that password was changed very, very quickly. Thanks, John. So as we said, you know, it can even get it can even get worse. So if you are a victim of cybercrime, what you really do need to do is report it. Sadly, only one percent of uh, cyber crimes get reported, and of that one percent, only one percent end up uh, being solved. Sadly, but you really do need to report it to the police. They are actually on your side. I think there is this fear that by reporting cyber crimes to the police, that they're going to dob you into the regulators. Um, they may remind you of your obligations, but they really are there to help you uh, with the uh, you being the victim. The other element is now we have uh, the GDPR. So if any personal data has been compromised and a personal data breach, then you may need to report that to the ICO. Uh, an example is a British Airways. Uh, they were hacked, their, their website was hacked and um, car skimming software was uh, injected and 500,000 transactions were compromised and they are looking uh, at a huge uh, regulatory fine. So, John, we've noticed that these firms, that there's been an increase in uh, data breaches. What's this about being sued? Well, the, what we're seeing is a significant increase in law firms advertising for data protection claims because um, people now have a right to sue for distress for, for any breaches of, of the GDPR or the Data Protection Act 2018. I mean, just, just last week, Claire's Accessories announced they've been subject to, to um, a data breach. It's what's called a Medge Cart attack. It, that was a similar attack that happened to British Airways. And literally within hours of Claire's announcing this, there were quite a number of law firms already advertising for customers of Claire's to come forward to sue for distress um, and any other losses that they may have suffered. Um, but just moving on from that, I, I just want to go back to the actual theme of this webinar. What, what's the worst that can happen? Well, I'm going to talk to you about a devastating attack that took place in 2014 against Sony Pictures and actually a very similar attack took place earlier this year on, on, on TravelX. The, the actual attack on Sony sent shockwaves through US national security and foreign policy, the international media and private enterprises globally. And what happened in, in November 2014? Workers at Sony suddenly found their computers froze and started to display the backdrop of a skeleton with a rather menacing message that Sony had been hacked by the GOP. These were later identified as being the guardians of peace. Um, this message threatened to release all of Sony's data unless the demands were met. Although they didn't actually specify what, what the demands were. Within minutes, this literally spread throughout the entire Sony Pictures network, deleting every bit of their data and backups leaving them crippled. And it actually reduced them to conducting business with pen, paper, and a single fax machine. Uh, within weeks, the GOP released nine large dumps of Sony's data, some 11 terabytes worth of confidential data on thousands of employees, details of actors' pay, embarrassing email exchange between Sony executives, five previously unreleased movies, um, as well as details on how to access Sony's production database and servers. This was actually later attributed to North Korea, although actually that evidence at best was very weak. There was no smoking gun at such. There was not even a gun. It was more like sort of tube-shaped objects, if you like. It's kind of more widely believed that the attack was carried out by uh, somebody called the Lazarus Group rather than a, a, a state-sponsored attack. And what this actually did, it highlighted Sony's really poor cybersecurity hygiene. Although they've never actually released uh, details of how the hackers got into Sony, 
Um, it is widely believed that it was done through some form of social engineering. Somebody somewhere in Sony has clicked on a link, opened an attachment in an email they shouldn't have. And this type of attack could have easily have been prevented with the ba most basic cybersecurity training for staff. And I know this is Sony and, and such a large corporation is able to, and indeed did bounce back from this, but this is happening all over at the moment with small businesses. They've been held to ransom for Bitcoin and having all their data deleted if they do not pay up. Now just stop and think for a minute. Think about your own business and what would happen if all you were left with was pen and paper. With all your data, all your emails, all your files, all your backups deleted forever. I'm pretty sure you'll agree that would be devastating for any business, large or small. Yes, and it, uh, thanks, John. And we've seen this, like I mentioned before, a huge increase in ransomware attacks, demanding hundreds of thousands of pounds in bitcoins to decrypt data. Uh, one particular client they're aware of has had 10 servers encrypted. So you can imagine the, the cost of not paying the bitcoins, but the actual cost of the business's downtime, which was evident with what happened with TravelX. I don't think they've actually recovered yet. No, no. So to protect your business, <clears throat> what do you need to do? Well, first of all, you really need to train staff. Um, as I mentioned before, you can have fancy uh, magic tech, as we call it, to stop those phishing emails coming through. What we're seeing at the moment is a huge increase in um, behavioral psychology and social engineering. So a lot of these criminals are actually researching the people that are targeting before they're targeted. So looking at their Facebook, they're looking at any LinkedIn, they're looking at just Googling the, the individual so that when they do ring up or send that message that they come across as being legitimate. So it's really important that there's ongoing phishing training and simulations and not just uh, basic, but explaining to your employees that it is becoming more and more sophisticated. As we've seen at the start of this pandemic, that pandemic, there has been a huge surge in everybody suddenly working from home. And this sometimes makes people less vigilant than they may be in the office. So again, you really need to train your staff. And we have some really cost-effective uh, cost training. Now, another thing that you can do to protect your business is to uh, obtain the Cyber Essential Certification. This is a government-backed scheme and in partnership with the National Cyber Security Center. And it's designed to help businesses become more cyber aware, helping them to uh, prevent the most common attacks that we often see happening. Um, it's important because those vulnerabilities to simple little attacks can leave you exposed to more in-depth attention from those cyber criminals. Once you become certified, then uh, you can display the logo on your website, which gives your clients and future clients um, a uh, sense of confidence that you're taking cybersecurity uh, seriously. So it's good for your reputation. You also uh, receive some free cyber insurance. If you're ever going to tender for government tenders, then uh, it's often a, a, a mandatory requirement and it's only £300 uh, plus that. So thank you for listening. Uh, we'll open up the floor for any questions. So I'm just going to hide my screen. Okay, we do have a question that's come up. Um, what is the one thing small businesses can do to protect themselves? John, do you want to answer that? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, the first thing I want to say is nobody can be 100% cyber secure. It's impossible. So if anybody is offering to make you 100% secure, you just really need to, to tread carefully there. But I, actually, there's two things you can do. Um, I know you said one, but uh, I'll talk about two. The, the first thing is to make sure you train your staff. The vast majority of cyber attacks are from human error. Somebody clicking on a link they shouldn't have, downloading a file they shouldn't have, plugging a USB stick into a computer they shouldn't have. Um, it, it really comes down to most attacks down to human error. And the other thing really is cyber essentials. I cannot stress enough how useful this is. It, it, it really focuses businesses' minds on all the basic necessities of cyber security, such as patch management, et cetera. And it will really help stop the majority of attacks out there. Thank you, John. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, thank you everybody for attending. 
we'll be putting this webinar on our YouTube channel uh, shortly, which is youtube.com slash greencdl. There will be subtitles, so you won't have to listen to us again. Um, so thanks for attending, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.